in uh, many ways. So uh, I'd like to talk about the anabelian geometry of Rosenthal. <clears throat> so one uh, central point in my talk is uh, to discuss the term anabelian. So this is a term which was uh, coined by uh, Grothendieck himself uh, without giving actually precise definition of this term, which is quite uh, unusual for uh, Grothendieck. But so the, one of the themes will be to explain or try to explain uh, this uh, term. So uh, I'd like to start with some personal uh, impressions on Grothendieck. <clears throat> uh, really, uh, extremely personal, how I, view, how I view him as a mathematician. So uh, I'd like to make the following propositions, <clears throat> statements. So first of all, uh, Grothendieck was a mathematician which was much ahead of his time. This is for me uh, one uh, very important uh, point. The themes he was uh, thinking about uh, at that time uh, were not really shared by, by any other uh, people. Uh, also, uh, uh, Grothendieck clearly is not a mathematician in the usual time. Okay, so, uh, and we should not, I think, think of him as an ordinary mathematician. So, he is what I would uh, name a philosopher mathematician. So, here I'm venturing into the territory of philosophy, exactly the same way as a philosopher who is not a mathematician who would venture into the territory of mathematics. Very interesting that in order to be able to pose a good mathematician, he had a philosopher. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, another more important point that I would like to, to stress also is that he was, in some sense, an isolated mathematician. And the reason is that some of uh, the uh, mathematical themes that were very high in his uh, agenda of interest were not shared by many people around. And I uh, think especially about the theory of eta fundamental. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in talking, it's difficult to talk about Grothendieck because of the, the large uh, mathematical scope we have. So it's, I think, you know, uh, living uh, and individual mathematician can uh, discuss all the spectrum, mathematical spectrum of Grothendieck. So I will certainly uh, skip to the things that we know uh, better on the mathematics of Grothendieck. Uh, which is Galois theory. <laughs> so Grothendieck had an outstanding contribution to Galois theory, so which I will uh, try to explain. <clears throat> also, I, I will throw uh, two questions, uh, kind of uh, mathematical, but more of uh, philosophical questions in, in my lectures, <clears throat> uh, without too much uh, discussing them, uh, possibly, but which in some sense are related to the mathematics of Grothendieck. So the first question is, what is the precise link on uh, the one hand analysis in topology and the other hand uh, algebra? <clears throat> so maybe I will say more about this, but roughly what I'm trying to say is that there are some deep uh, theorems or statements which are purely algebraic, whose proof relies essentially on analysis and topology and vice versa. So we saw I <coughs> talked about the Ramanujan, uh, uh, problem which was solved by uh, Berlin using uh, algebraic uh, <clears throat> methods. So I'm just wondering or wondering what is going on uh, precisely between these two. What is the interdependence between uh, these uh, two areas? <clears throat> uh, the other question is what is the precise gap between commutative and non commutative mathematics? So this is. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, this is related to the theme of my lecture because the term non commutative is related to the term anabelian. So anabelian should be as understood in some sense as not being abelian uh, or far from uh, being abelian, so kind of uh, non commutative. So I, I will have uh, more to say about this second question yes, and how it is related to. Uh, Anabelian geometry and uh, the work of uh, Rothen. <clears throat> so uh, now starting my uh, mathematical talk, I will go uh, backward some 200 years ago and uh, speak about another great mathematician who was Evarist Gallo. Right? And <clears throat> uh, I would like to remind you very briefly uh, what uh, Galois did. Uh, 
So what Galois did is he associated to a given polynomial. So if you take polynomial with rational coefficients, say which is reducible, then he associated what we call now the Galois group of this polynomial, which is a finite group, which roughly is a, a group of certain permutations of the roots of uh, this polynomial. <clears throat> and what he proved, uh, he proved the following theorem. Uh, the polynomial F is solvable by radicals, meaning that you can find a formula for the solutions of this polynomial, which is similar to the formula which describes the solution of whether the polynomial, uh, if and only if this Galois group is a solvable group. Maybe you can build it uh, successively by, uh, by extent, extensions of uh, finite agreement groups. So at that time, so as you know, so this is a basic fact that one learns in the uh, uh, theory uh, course. And uh, this, as you know, solved a thousand years problem. So this is the problem of solving polynomials by radical was a uh, major problem in uh, ancient and uh, middle age mathematics. And what basically people were doing were just trying to, to prove that you can all, always find solutions uh, or find a formula for the solution of any polynomial. And what Galois did, he came, of course, he was influenced a little bit by the work of Abel and Ripley. And he just said, look, does it work like this? So it's not the case that every polynomial is solvable by radicals. And this is the reason why. I, I am not a historian of mathematics, but I think this is the first uh, theorem in modern mathematics, in the sense that it proves uh, a statement about object A by proving the statement about object B, which is a priori not very much related to object A. And so on the one hand, you have so solutions of polynomial equations. A priori, this has nothing to do with the group being solvable or even with the theory of groups. And in fact, he introduced group theory and introduced object. Group theory, and this was the beginning of group theory and Galois theory. <clears throat> so, uh, some hundred years later, so, uh, people defined the Galois group of P. I think this was done by uh, Wolfgang Krull. <clears throat> so, uh, you have a field, K, okay, and if you, the field, you should think of it as a system of numbers where you have addition and multiplication satisfying uh, certain properties. Then you can look to uh, algebraic closure of this field, which is obtained by adjoining roots of all polynomials with coefficients in this uh, field. And the Galois group is the group of automorphisms. Uh, uh, K bar is algebraic closure, which fixes uh, the elements of K. <clears throat> uh, of course, this definition is, uh, first of all, this Galois group is a profinite group. It has a topology, which is called the profinite topology. It's a projective limit of finite groups. And so it's quite close to, to, to finite groups, but it's something that mathematicians know quite uh, well. And this uh, correspondence, namely associating a Galois group to field, is functorial. And what you have, in fact, you have a functor from the category of fields to the category of profinite groups, which to a field associates its uh, Galois group. <laughs> Now, the, the, the central problem in Galois theory is to describe the image of this function. If you have a field K, can you describe uh, explicitly the Galois group of this field? Now, what does it mean to describe explicitly for finite groups? Well, can we have several interpretations? But one of them, for example, can you give a description by generators in the relations of uh, the, the, the Galois group of uh, <coughs> field? And uh, it turns out that this is an extremely difficult question. And the fact is that even in very basic cases, for example, in the case of the field of rational numbers, one, have, one does not know the structure of the structure of the full Galois group of GQ. And in fact, uh, more generally, for any infinite finitely generated field, the Galois group is mysterious. And so we have no idea how to describe uh, uh, this uh, Galois group. Now, in some sense, Annabellian geometry explains this difficulty. So why is it so difficult to, 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 to describe the Galois group of, uh, of uh, finitely generated fields, say? Well, Annabellian geometry provides a certain uh, answer. 
which uh, I will uh, uh, explain. <coughs> but just to throw it very quickly, it's because the, the Galois group encodes the main information on the field. That's why it's so difficult to, to touch. It's, 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 <clears throat> now, a number theory is, and uh, so in order to circumvent this difficulty, they, they adopted several approaches to understand the Galois group, of, uh, uh, especially number fields. So if you have a number field, the finite extension of uh, Q. So there are various approaches. <coughs> so, uh, the first one is class field theory. The class field theory was a major topic in number theory uh, in the first half of the previous century and quite successful. So it succeeded in uh, the outcome is that there is uh, quite explicit and satisfactory description of the Galois of the maximal Abelian quotient of the Galois group of the number. So Galois group or the profile group has a maximum Abelian quotient. And this, in the case of uh, Galois groups of number fields, this maximal Abelian quotient is, there is quite satisfactory description of uh, this uh, Abelian uh, quotient. <clears throat> there is another approach, uh, Essentially, this is Iwazawa theory, which in some sense tries to understand the maximal meta abelian quotient of the Galois group of uh, number field. Also, uh, there is the inverse Galois problem approach. So, here one would like to describe uh, the finite groups which are quotients of uh, the Galois group of number field. Of course, Hilbert and Shaparidic here. Uh, uh, <coughs> some very important contributions. and. Uh, an optimistic conjecture here is, for example, that every finite group is a portion of the Galois group of Q. But actually, even if, you, if this turns out to be true, this will not uh, give a description of the Galois group of a number P, because these Galois groups are not finite in general. So they are not determined by their finite portions. <clears throat> Uh, another very successful uh, approach is the theory of Galois representations, of course, very uh, famous mathematicians contributed to this, which eventually led to the proof of Fermat's last theorem. And so here, the, 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 the approach is to study the finite dimension of Galois representations of the Galois group of the number field. And of course, uh, Langlands program also, uh, which is a set of, of conjectural framework, which relates several objects which are related to number fields and Galois groups. And functions, automorphic forms, and presentations of algebraic groups, uh, and so, <clears throat> so more or less all these approaches were uh, around when Grothendieck entered the scene of Galois theory. That was in 1960. So 1960, uh, Grothendieck published uh, SGA1. Okay, so this is the first seminar of algebraic geometry, fundamental, well, fundamental, and uh, <clears throat> what he did. In SGA1, he, uh, in the spirit of Galois, of Galois theory, so as I explained, to feed you can associate the Galois group. And what he did in full generality to a scheme, connected scheme, uh, he associated uh, an etal fundamental, he called it etal fundamental group, which is a propanet group. <clears throat> so the star stands for a uh, base point. You have to choose a base point in order to define the etal fundamental group. And, but in order to do this, we have to find the right uh, analog in algebraic geometry of the notion of the topological cover. This was the notion of finite etal cover, which you can define purely algebraically. So these are covers, which locally are uh, obtained by adjoining the root of a single uh, separable polynomial. But as uh, Grothendieck pointed out himself in SGA1, in the case where X is a normal scheme, this fundamental group is just a Galois group. It's a certain Galois group of a certain extension of the function field of the scheme. So that's uh, quite close to uh, Galois theory. And the case where X is the spectrum of the field, then the, the fundamental group is just a Galois group. <clears throat> now, in the case where uh, X is an algebraic variety over uh, field K, uh, one has this exact sequence. So this is a quite important exact sequence. You have the fundamental group of X, which projects onto the fundamental group of K, which is the Galois group. This is just by functorianity, fundamental group. 
And uh, the kernel is called the geometry fundamental group of this. Okay. So I'm skipping the base points from uh, now on. And <clears throat> so this is called the fundamental exact uh, sequence. Uh, from this sequence, actually, you can uh, deduce a Galois representation. Outer, what is called an outer Galois representation. You see, if you take an element of GK, you lift it to an element of phi one of X, and then you act by inner conjugation on uh, the geometric part. And this action is defined modulo inner conjugation by an element in the geometric part. So what you get, you get a representation of what well, this is called an outer representation of GK into uh, the group of outer automorphisms of the geometric part of the family. Now, uh, the, this, this outer representation, so first of all, in some important cases, you can go uh, backwards from the Galois distant outer representations with a recovered exact sequence. So this is this happens in the case where the geometric part is centered. So you can go backwards. So these two things are essentially equivalent in the case where the geometric part is centered. So I have to say that this outer representation was uh, Extremely high in uh, the agenda of mathematical and philosophical philosophy. So this, there is no doubt about this, and uh, I will explain more. <clears throat> okay, uh, of course, uh, Grotenik proved several uh, factorial properties and important properties of fundamental groups in SGA1, but he also proved a very specific result, quite an important result. He, he, he succeeded in describing the prime to be part. The, the geometric fundamental group of an algebraic curve in characteristic P. So if, if you take if you take <coughs> a smooth and proper curve <coughs> of genus G, right? So for a given genus G, you have uh, this group gamma G. This is a discrete group. This is a surface group. So this is the topological fundamental group of the uh, Riemann surface of genus G. So this is an object which comes from topology. And you can look to its propanite completion. This is the, the, the wedge, right? So take the, the, the projective limit of the finite portion of this. And uh, in characteristic zero, <coughs> actually, or say if X is defined over the complex numbers, then you have an associated Riemann surface. And uh, what you can prove is that the, the geometric fundamental group of X is isomorphic to this gamma G uh, wedge. So in other words, the geometric fundamental group of an algebraic curve with the characteristic zero for complex numbers is isomorphic to the profinite completion, the topological fundamental group of a Riemann surface of the same genus. And so this is, and this is true over so over complex numbers. This was known. This is due to this is a consequence of the Riemann resistance theory and the, the complex uh, Gaga. Uh, algebraic analytic uh, theorem. This was probably known to Andre Vey in the case of complex numbers. Also for characteristic zero, this is the, the method of this and or the Lefschetz principle, which was developed by Jordan Dick also. And so in characteristic zero, things of, of an algebraic enclosed fields. So things happened exactly uh, the same as over complex numbers. But what Jordan Dick proved is that in characteristic P, if you take the, the prime to be part of the geometric fundamental group of an algebraic curve, so prime to be part, you just look to the finite portions whose order is prime to the characteristic and you take the project in the group. And then that he proves that this is the same as the prime to be part of this gamma G wedge. Yeah. So this is quite interesting. So this 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 is a conjecture of that. This was conjectured by A, Andre Bay. So he said that the, the, the prime to characteristic uh, part of the fundamental group in characteristic P for algebraic curves should be the same as the prime to be part uh, in characteristic zero. But Andre Bay could not prove it because simply because he did not have the right language. Actually, he, 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 he knew what one has to do. So you have to have a flexible language of algebraic geometry, flexible, which goes from characteristic zero to characteristic P in a flexible way. But of course, the, the theory of schemes of Grothendieck does this. In fact, this is a consequence also of uh, the theorem of existence in formal geometry. It's, it's the theory of specialization of Grothendieck for fundamental groups. <clears throat> now, uh, Müller, who is uh, one of the first uh, algebraic geometers in the Netherlands, so I met him some 25 years ago, he told me the story. 
So he went to Chicago in the 1950s to study algebra geometry with Andre Bay. And he told me that there was a tension between Andre Bay and Lord and the kind of tension that we heard about in the talk about Gulbaki. And but he told me that when Lord and Deep proved this, uh, they urged him to go to Paris and to study algebra geometry with Lord. Because since Lord and Deep could prove this, then he must have the right language of algebra geometry. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> now just to go back to these uh, outer representations. Right? So there are some fundamental examples that I would like to, to cite, which are uh, quite relevant in number theory and arithmetic geometry. So first one is the case where X is an elliptic curve. <coughs> in this case, the geometric fundamental group is abelian. So it's three abelian or two generators. And this outer representation is just uh, unusual. Uh, Galois representation, which is uh, uh, in number theory, Galois representation is associated to elliptic curves. It's a, a, a usual representation in GL2, right? And essentially, the study of this Galois representation led to the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Now, if, if you remove the one point from the elliptic curve, say the origin, so you have an affine curve, and you look to the geometric fundamental group. So I'm, I'm in characteristic zero, so let's say characteristic zero. So the, the geometric fundamental group of this affine group, uh, this affine curve is a profinite three on two generators. So remember the gamma g. And so the, the here it's gamma two wedge. <coughs> and so you get a, a Galois representation of GQ to, to uh, the group of outer automorphisms of F2. And also if, uh, X is the projective line minus three points. So again, the geometric fundamental group is F2, and you get uh, this uh, Galois representation also. Of course, these two Galois representations are not the same. So F2 is the, the same, but they are uh, quite different from each other. Now, I, I, I uh, uh, Elise, who is an eminent student of Grothendi, told me several times that uh, Grothendi told him in 1966. That he, uh, he had ideas how to use this later representation to prove Fermat's last theorem. Actually, now, almost 55 years later, I think nobody had an idea how to use this to prove, uh, <coughs> to prove uh, Fermat's last theorem. So, this is what I was trying to say about uh, uh, Grothendieck being an isolated mathematician. So, at that time, so of course, people were thinking about. Other thing, but he was thinking about this uh, Galois representation, and <clears throat> uh, which I will discuss it again later. Now, from the parution of SGA1, there was no substantial work on arithmetic fundamental groups, I think, until the mid 80s. The work of Ihara, Berlin, also on arithmetic fundamental groups, and the work of Griffin, mid 80s. And uh, Grothendieck did not write anything about arithmetic fundamental groups, I think, substantial during the years where he was very active in Paris at EHS, etc. So, of course, he was uh, busy developing the language of algebra geometry, writing the PGA, uh, uh, other SGAs, also the topic of cohomology, uh, other things, but no substantial work on arithmetic fundamental groups. <clears throat> He, he came back to this uh, somehow later, did not come back, I should not say this, because as I said, he was thinking about this, but he, he came back actively to this after he somehow retired from the, 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 the mathematical community. <clears throat> okay. But then uh, something happened uh, during uh, the 1980s, of course, uh, Gerd Frankfurt with the model conjecture was a big moment in uh, number theory. But improving the model conjecture, he proved uh, along the way two conjectures, which were in fact, and this one's a very good approach to the model, which are the Tate conjecture and the Shabarinich conjecture. <clears throat> and the Tate conjecture, I will mean, mean, uh, explain uh, just now, is somehow related to Anabilian geometry. Just after this proof, Broughton did send him a letter, quite well, famous letter. Uh, short letter by Broken Big Standards, nine, ten pages, and <clears throat> quite interesting letter. So actually, he did not, he doesn't talk about more than what the proof of patterns. 
he just outlines uh, what he called the Anabelian program in this level. Okay. How this is related to the proof of model, etc. Well, <clears throat> I, I will try to say uh, something. Now, uh, what are uh, these conjectures? I will state them, okay, and then uh, try to discuss it. <clears throat> so, uh, say you have a finitely generated gene, okay, uh, characteristic zero. I'm just talking about characteristic zero. And so, finitely generated fields are just fields to be uh, finite transcendence to be. <clears throat> And uh, first of all, the first conjecture is what is called the uh, Barashan Anabelian conjecture. Take, take, take two finitely generated fields, L and F, over this field K. Then, of course, you have factoriality of the Galois. If you have an embedding from F to L, say K embedding, then it gives rise to homomorphism, the Galois group of L to the Galois group of F. This is just factoriality. And this is up to this. Uh, Delta here, this is up to inner conjugations of the GF. So this inner conjugation accounts for the uh, ambiguity of choosing the base point. Okay. So in any case, you, this map between the, the homomorphism, field homomorphism on one, on one side between F and L, and the, the, the continuous uh, homomorphism between the corresponding uh, groups in the right direction, of course. Modulo is ambiguity to choose based on the uh, separate equations. And what uh, Rotten did conjecture is that this should be bijection. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so, uh, just briefly, I will mention this later. But what this says is that if you look to the, the functor, the Galois functor that I, I mentioned from the category of finite genetic groups to the category of profile groups, what he's saying is that this should be a fully faithful functor. So in other words, you, you should be able to embed the category of finite generated fields into the category of finite fields. And then you can be able to put the, the lenses of properly group theory and uh, see uh, finitely generated fields. So this is the, 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 the birational Anabelian conjecture. The, the second conjecture is uh, uh, regarding arithmetic fundamental groups. And it is stated in the case of uh, hyperbolic curves, but <clears throat> yeah, so let me state it. So if you have two uh, hyperbolic curves over the same uh, field, hyperbolic here means the, the other concurrent characteristic is negative or hyperbolic in the, the classical geometric sense. Then again, if you have a non-constant uh, morphism from X to Y, then by factoriality it gives a, a continuous open, in this case, homomorphism, from pi one of x to pi one of uh, y, and again modulo inner conjugation of pi one of y, but inner conjugation by elements of pi one of y. What uh, Grotten did conjecture is that uh, this should be bijection. Again, what he's saying is that you should be able the the, the, the map from the category of hyperbolic curves to uh, the category of profinite curve groups, which is provided by pi one. The pi one of curve is fully faithful. Okay, so uh, what has this to do with, uh, with uh, first of all, several remarks regarding these conjectures and uh, this letter. The, the first one is that the conjectures are very precise. In fact, they turn out to be exactly correct in the way that they were stated. This is the first one. Well, the second uh, comment is that it's not clear that Grothen had any example or anything which suggests that this conjecture should be true. Because there is no thing that you can compute or check in this case. The, <clears throat> okay. The, the, other the other point is how, okay, this maybe I will say it, uh, later, how this is related to the Tate conjecture, which is maybe one of the reasons that uh, Grothen did send his letter to uh, Parting. Well, the Tate conjecture resembles a little bit to this. What the Tate conjecture says is that if you have two abelian varieties over finitely generated fields, then we use two homomorphisms between A and B, and you cancel by Z hat, and then you again you get a natural map, you get natural uh, homomorphism between the geometric fundamental groups, in this case, which are just the Tate modules, and which are equivalent, and uh, the, the action of the Galois group of the base field. The G. And what Tate conjectured, <coughs> what he proved first over finite fields, right? This over finite fields, and he conjectured that this should be true. 
was proven by uh, Zahir, the characteristic, positive characteristic, after eight to the four finite bits, and by Fatih's the characteristic uh, zero. Of course, this resembles a little bit to the Grotten conjecture. But if you think about the case of an elliptic curve, right, what the Tate conjecture says, right, so this is the, 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 the two examples that I said, right, in the case of an elliptic curve, what the Tate conjecture says, but the, the power presentation associated to uh, the, the elliptic curve determines the isogenic class, the elliptic curve. But in other words, all elliptic curves which are isogenous to this. But the, the isogenic class can be too, too large. Okay? And it's huge in general. Now, what Grotendi conjecture is saying, okay, remove one point from the elliptic curve. Okay? Look to the second example. Then this uh, outer representation now, from G2 to uh, Galois outer of F2, not only determines the isogeny uh, class of the elliptic curve, it determines the isomorphism class of the elliptic as, as a scheme, as a parameter. I personally do not see any analogy between the two, but Grothendieck somehow suggests that this, this, the, the Tate conjecture is, is somehow uh, similar or resembles to these uh, conjectures. <clears throat> Yeah. So uh, anyway, what 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 is what is the, the main thread which, which uh, was driving the, the, the thinking of what I did? I think it's I mean I, I if I'm not mistaken, this state would be somewhere. So you, you look to this exact sequence, the, the fundamental exact sequence that I mentioned. So I would say in the case of uh, hyperbolic curve over a cubic of the So as I stated, so the geometric part is essentially this uh, dimension hat. So on this side, so what do you have? You have an exact sequence, you have a four finite group. And this four finite group is in some sense accommodating these two objects. Okay? Now, if you look on the right, this object is of the algebraic nature. That was group of general number three. This object is of topological nature. And what Grothendieck is suggesting, okay, if you have a setup like this, which accommodates both arithmetic and topology, then it must be very rigid. And this is the, the main, I think, ambition behind uh, behind uh, stating his conjecture. So this 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 theme of uh, the interaction between topology and arithmetic was was very uh, very uh, fundamental in the thinking. <laughs> but the key point is that okay, arithmetic and topology interact. But what is the key point here is that Profinite group theory accommodates this. So you have the setup. So it's a kind of you have a first floor or ground floor, you have arithmetic, topology, geometry, etc. On the top floor, you have group theory, and group theory somehow can accommodate all, uh, all uh, these theories. Now, what Grothendieck wants us to go, he wants us to go to the second floor to look to influence the group theory and look back downstairs. This is exactly what is the situation. Anyway, <clears throat> now uh, also uh, I don't know how it's not clear to me how Fatih responded to this uh, uh, letter. Possibly, uh, Grothendieck wanted to enroll Fatih in the project of proving this conjecture because it's really the outlines to him in his project. And I think he's the only one who, which he first outlined this uh, uh, project. But this, uh, I don't know. But in fact, he was doing other things. He did other things. He did not uh, uh, very seriously into uh, this uh, conjecture. Neither people who were somehow close to Grothendieck. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So I, I should say that the only person uh, close to Grothendieck who had a genuine interest and a deep interest in the fundamental group is Deligny. But somehow Deligny was moving in a different direction. Motivic fundamental groups, it's, 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 it's somehow uh, motivic theory, uh, etc. But uh, the, 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 the person who picked up uh, quite seriously the content of this letter is uh, Ihara in Japan. So Ihara was 
uh, working on the general presentation of uh, G2 on the geometry fundamental group of T1 minus T1, this general presentation. And he, he picked up uh, the complete of uh, this uh, letter. And then <coughs> immediately after that, uh, some uh, very serious developments uh, happened. <coughs> so, what happened? So, <coughs> Actually, this is, first of all, the, 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 the conjectures turns out to be true. They were proven in the mid 90s. But uh, it turns out, first of all, the, 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 there is the ISOM form. So the ISOM, so it's not any conjecture, as I stated then, it's a home form, so it's homomorphism. So you can just look to isomorphism. And the ISOM form, actually, uh, in the Barashman phase, in the phase of number fields, was already proven by Uchida and Nurkish. In the 1970s. Now, this is very interesting because we learned in the first lecture that Anabelian geometry was rated by Grotten and Kinsip as one of the deepest of his disorders. Actually, one of the main theories of Anabelian geometry was already proved in 1970 by Nurkish and But clearly, Grotten was not the one of this theory. It's very clear, otherwise, he would have cited it. Right. Not only this, but Grotten did not propose any techniques. In his letter, how to tackle this conjecture, and what turns out to be very relevant are the techniques which are the, which were developed by location notation. This is very interesting. I had a discussion the other day with one of the participants, and I said that even if Grotten did not exist, possibly fifty percent of the mathematics that he did would have been done by others, possibly in a different way. But this is this is very interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> then. Uh, uh, Pope and uh, Pope in general took the Bayer-Schumer conjecture, the Eisen form for finite infinite fields. Schwitz also might help in, in, in a special case in the uh, uh, chronicle dimension two in characteristic uh, zero. And you see here this 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 are German school, German school because in Germany they knew the work of location and in Japan also. <clears throat> And then the development came from Japan. So Ihara put uh, some of his students on uh, uh, the growth and conjecture. So Nakamura first, he put some uh, special cases of the growth and conjecture for hyperbolic curves where uh, finitely generated fields. So P1 minus uh, finitely many points. And then a breakthrough come, came with Kamagawa, who proved uh, completely the, the, the ISOM form of the second Anabini conjecture for affine curves. And then what you do uh, uh, it, uh, is uh, it, uh, in general for proper uh, curve. So all these are uh, school of Iha, people around Iha. Okay. Then uh, Mochizuki also, uh, when in the mid 90s, took a very interesting result, and good result. He proved that the, this Anabelian conjecture, he proved that they hold in general the home form, so everything is uh, true. But more generally, they hold over not only over uh, finitely generated fields, but over sub periodic fields, what we call sub periodic fields. So these are sub fields of finitely generated fields over periodic fields. And what he uses, he uses periodic methods, periodic Hodge theory. Now, this is another instance of what I was saying uh, before. This is a purely algebraic statement, which is proven somehow by analytic methods, and periodic Hodge theory is in some sense <clears throat> of uh, analytic nature. Okay, so we have a nice picture here. So these uh, conjectures are proven. So as I said, we have these two functors, which turns out to be uh, fully faithful. This is what these theorems uh, prove. But still, uh, we are in a situation. So I have to say, I entered somehow this scene some 20 years ago or so. so I started uh, doing the mathematical research, serious ones. 30 years ago, also as a student, so I went to Bordeaux. Ahmed was a professor there. And in my last year course, I, uh, I so the only course on SGA1, what that meant, I go from the matter. So I had to meet SGA1. I can discuss it and try to meet it. You are interested. But then I was interested in the first aspect of uh, the problem, describing Galois groups, and describing the structure of fundamental groups. So I did some work, but essentially I did not succeed uh, in solving the problems I was interested in, which are still unsolved. 
Uh, but I tried to come, I started to compare what of men are in Germany. Why is it so difficult to describe the dialogues and this one that <coughs> So I tried some to contemplate this picture of I just uh, drawn here. And uh, what puzzled me always is this. There are these situations where these functors, which are fully capable, so you can embed these categories into the category of four kind of groups, but you don't know what is the image. How do such a theorems relate to uh, a working mathematician, working member of this? Who is interested in computing examples and specific understanding a specific framework, etc. Well, not much. And this is the reason why the, the figure of communication for Chida was not known for a month. It was just reviving in the 19th month. Because if you are a member of this, okay, you are telling me that the general of the member of the it's isomorphic type, this determines the isomorphic type of. The but I don't know what is the government of the But what is interesting is how could people prove these theorems without knowing the structure of this matrix? Now, if you dig a little bit uh, deep inside the proofs, you will, have, you will realize something very interesting going on. In fact, in all the proofs, one does not need to know the full number groups and the full form on the matrix. In fact, you just need to know the small uh, pieces, which are almost ideal. And give you where the, the, the mystery starts. So, of course, I aim to improve somehow uh, this uh, situation. So, I, I uh, start discussing with uh, anyway, what is the meaning of anabilis? So I started contemplating the meaning of it. So, here is a quote from these people who proved all these theorems essentially. And where they say that anabilian algebraic variety means roughly. Algebraic variety whose uh, geometry whose geometry is controlled by its fundamental group. I would agree with this, but then what they say, which is assumed to be far from a bit. In other words, what they are saying is that these theorems hold because the Galois group and the fundamental groups which are we are considering are far from being abelian. I contemplated for a long time this statement far from being abelian, and I came to the conclusion that it has no specific mathematical meaning. <clears throat> In fact. It turns out that this intuition is wrong. Okay, so what is the right anabelian geometry? So I started discussing with uh, Akira Tamagawa some 15 years ago, and we improved this situation. So we proved uh, uh, a variant of the broken root conjecture, essentially for hyperbolic curves over the finite fields, where instead of considering the full fundamental group, we consider just some small portions. So the, the, the geometry if you prime to characteristic, the geometry if you call sigma or uh, uh, sigma where sigma is a certain set of primes. Anyway, some, some variants which are slightly better than uh, the first variant in the sense that the Galois group we consider are smaller. So we prove that the isomorphic type of smaller fundamental groups and smaller Galois groups determine the field. And then uh, we, what we were trying Somehow is to prove the pro L version of this. So the Tate conjecture holds in a pro L version. So the Arabic Galois representation associated with the variety determines the isogenic class. So we try to see whether uh, such a pro L version is. And you look to the, so in this exact sequence, you replace this by its maximum pro L portion. But around 2015, we came to the conclusion that clearly this is not possible. Akira Magawa has an example which suggests that uh, this might not be possible. And so 2015, as far as I'm concerned, so I will try to square zero. Just think what is what is what is the meaning of Anabin. And spent somehow two years until some, some one day in, on May 2017, something very special happened. So I I, I glanced into uh, archive into a paper of number theory. Had nothing to do with Anabelian geometry. It was about uh, Abelian Galois groups of member fields and uh, L functions. <clears throat> and immediately when I read the introduction, something extraordinary happened. Immediately I thought this should be the right version of Anabelian geometry. And so I will explain uh, this and maybe so, and the right uh, version. So <clears throat> hopefully the most optimal. Is uh, the M step solvable anabelian So, what is this? So, you have pro finite groups, Galois groups, etc. What you have, you, 
you have the, 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 the derived series inside this demo loops, and you can look for the corresponding uh, portions, right? The GIs. So G1 is just the maximal abelian portion, G2 is the maximal meta abelian portion, G3 is the maximal three step abelian portion, okay? And so on. <clears throat> now, so if in case of arithmetic interesting, if K is a number field, so if M is one, GK1 is the abelian Galois group of a number field, it's described by class one, okay? This portion GKM also in principle should be described by class one. Okay, because what you are doing, if you think about GK2, for example, right? GK2 is to be a number of three when it projects into GK1, which you know by class one theory, and there is a kernel here. But this kernel actually is just the projective limit of abelianized Galois groups of uh, finite abelian extensions of F. Those extensions which come from this portion. So each of these is described by class field theory. So one should be able to describe this projective limit and this loop extension. What do I have to say? This is not the number theory. But this is something which is accessible with the mathematical tools we have, we should be able to do this. And, and then as I said, so in 2017, so after what happened in May, this flash, I went to a few of those that were. This, this statement should be true. It was surprised a little bit, but then I started working and we proved the following theorem. So, this is an analog of the first Barashunian conjecture. Okay, so for finitely generated field. And what we proved essentially that the Ison form, so no home form, uh, the Ison form holds essentially when you replace uh, the full absolute Galois groups by these M sets of global portions. For small values of this is quite important. So this holds for all M are bigger or to this quantity. So the D is the chronicle dimension. So in the case of number things, this quantity is three. In other words, what we proved is that uh, GK3, the three steps of the Galois group of a number field, determines the isomorphic type of the number. Now, if you look to the gap between GK and this GK3, it's huge. So we really we shrink huge gap. So, <clears throat> so the, 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 the statement and the statement as that I stated before somehow lead in two completely different ways. <clears throat> and uh, it is expected the similar result should hold for uh, the second conjecture for identity fundamental groups, for example, for hyperbolic curves over uh, not finitely generated. For finitely generated field, should, this work should hold, but this inequality should hold only over number. For hyperbolic curves of a number which should, should go. <clears throat> anyway, so some comments about this. Well, the, the first comment is that uh, as far as Amelian geometry is concerned, we don't need to know the full the absolute Galois group of a number. So what we need to know is just this is uh, M steps of global portions. For example, in 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 uh, in this uh, second statement that I said it's expected to hold. So what you are saying is that hyperbolic curves are determined or the isomorphic type is determined by the isomorphic type of the M step solvable uh, arithmetic fundamental group. Now this M step solvable arithmetic fundamental group, so the full fundamental group project onto the full absolute value. But this one just projects on the GKM. So GK does not appear in this picture as well. So we, we don't need to know uh, GK and Anabinian geometry. Of course, this statement may be uh, somehow <clears throat> some number, some number theory is disagree with this, but this is the situation, at least for the time being. Uh, the second remark, which is quite important, theorem A, the theorem, this, this one, reconciles uh, Anabinian geometry with uh, class field theory. So we learned from Ahmed this morning that Rotenbeek had a difficult contact with class field theory. I'm not sure what Rotenbeek would have made of this statement. We, we proved and the statement and the, that I just explained. But uh, for me, <coughs> I was always thinking I have the, the background, the working mathematician and the working number theorist. The working number theorist is well acquainted with uh, class field theory, right? And this is 
theorems on our open science and the geometry of the classroom theory. So there are things you need to compute and to try explicit things that to try to understand. For example, these objects here that I just did. And the, the other fact also, which <coughs> is revealed by these theorems, is that the Anabelian world, as it is presented in Anabelian geometry, actually is closer to the so this intuition of people and actually experts in this area, which thought that Anabelian geometry or the term Anabelian means far from being Anabelian at the This is all means. I'm still processing this, it's, it's still a mystery. <clears throat> it's still a mystery. Okay, now to, to, to close up a little bit, I, I, I again venture into the area of philosophy. Huh? So after 2019, so from 2017, 2019, we were, we put this first theorem, the inspiration of that And then after 2019, so for the pandemic started. So, and almost during the whole pandemic time, I, what I did, I tried to reprocess what happened in my mind and which led to the proof of these theorems. Okay. Now, I, I have to say, so exactly, so exactly the same situation as with Rotten. So, how did I speak on myself, of course, not, not speaking on uh, behalf of my collaborator, uh, Tamagawa, but speaking uh, on uh, myself. So, I I said between 2015 and 2017, I was just contemplating the situation if something happened in 2017, this really this flash. So during this time, I had no example, no example, no concrete situation that I worked out, nothing to put on paper. I'm just spending hours and hours and hours contemplating until this flash happened. Now, how this flash happened? That's, 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 that's. So I tried to, to, to explain it, and I have to confess that I had uh, difficulties to explain it, right? Until I started preparing this lecture, okay? And uh, so when I started preparing the lecture, I read the letter of Jordan uh, to Parkins again, of course, because I read it before. And then immediately when I started reading the first paragraph, I realized exactly what happened to me. In fact, what happened is that I endorsed faithfully uh, the mathematical philosophy of Grotendieck. Now, what is the mathematical philosophy of Grotendieck? So, no one better than him to explain this. So, I invite you to uh, read with you this uh, paragraph from the first page uh, of the letter. <clears throat> so, what is Grotendieck saying? So, what my experience of mathematical work has taught me again and again is that the proof always springs from the inside and not the other way around. Okay. And that the inside itself has its source first and foremost in a delicate and obstinate feeling, feeling, it's not the feeling of the relevant entities and concepts and their mutual relation. Okay. The guiding thread is the inner coherence of the image which gradually emerges from the mist. So that's exactly what happened to me in May 2017. The image suddenly actually not gradually emerging from the mist, as well as its consonance with what is known or foreshadowed from other sources. This is very interesting. The other sources is what I will call practical mathematics. So many people say that what well, they did not care about examples and things like that. It's not so it's very <clears throat> and it guides all the more surely as the exigence of coherence is stronger and more deep. I found this text fascinating. <clears throat> it reveals to us how authentic was the exactly exactly what it is. So my understanding, of course, people can interpret uh, <clears throat> in different way. So what uh Rotendic is saying, so for us, and it seems to me what he's saying is that he's trying to uh, develop an intimate uh, mantle and intellectual relationship between him and mathematical entity. And somehow, awaits uh, these uh, mathematical uh, objects or entities to reveal themselves to him. This is very mystical. This is what 
several sects in various religions do, which uh, do uh, dedicate and very special meditation, uh, expect the divine to reveal to them. It's, it's extraordinary. Okay. And I, 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 I want to, I feel connected to this because I experience this. <clears throat> okay, of course, a lot of things that one can say about uh, European view. One thing that I would like to say is that, of course, it's very unfortunate that the mathematical community did not benefit from him as much. So, as we know, so we spent uh, half uh, or maybe more of his uh, life somehow isolated from the mathematical community. So that's uh, somehow uh, unfortunate. See, so he passed away. So, so there's nothing what he can change now. So this is just his story. But the question for me is how can we benefit from Rotten today? And that's the question. I, again, I just want to throw uh, a <clears throat> So, first, I, I think we should embrace more his mathematical philosophy in our way of doing research in mathematics. And reconcile his philosophy with practical, with practical mathematics. We should do more of this, what I just read from Rotten. Of course, one should be quite realistic here. So I, I, I am not suggesting to embrace fully the, 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 the philosophy of Rotten, in the sense that Rotten was somehow extreme. So we just follow it faithfully, this philosophy, without any compromise. But speaking uh, on my uh, humble case and this experience that I just related, so what I have in, in my mind is the practical mathematician, it's practical mathematics. What really what was guiding me is how to reconcile this mathematics of what with practical mathematics. This is possible. <clears throat> okay. But we should do more of uh, the mathematics of Rotten Dick and also embrace his mathematical philosophy in our way of teaching mathematics. So we are somehow used most of the time to teach practical mathematics. We teach students how to solve practical problems, how to do this, but we should teach them more how to think about mathematical objects. I don't know what is the best way to do this, but, <laughs> but I think we should do more of this. Thank you. Thank you.